Our final speaker of the morning is Dan Stern, who's going to talk about obscured quasars. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for uh, allowing me this opportunity to talk about obscured quasars, which are the dominant quasar population. I'm going to give a little bit of historical perspective, and then the uh, bulk of the talk will be some very new, uh, recent results from New Star and the WISE satellite. And, uh, kudos to a lot of my collaborators, especially from the WISE team listed here, and many who are in the audience today. Uh, by quasar, I mean um, supermassive black hole accreting at very high uh, rates and emitting at close to the Eddington luminosity. Um, I may be, I may be Chandra Sekhar was right. We shouldn't be using the quasar term, because that what I just described is not a quasi-stellar radio source. Um, and as noted very shortly after the discovery of 3C273, the radio part of quasar isn't a major part of the quasar population. Um, very shortly after the discovery of 3C273, people were chasing down blue compact sources that were too blue to be stars or galaxies that had UV excess. The color selections that we're doing more recently with Sloan, still looking for things with UV excess. And we now realize that the radio loud population is a minority part of the quasar population, maybe 10 to 15 percent. Uh, similarly, the uh, quasi-stellar part is in error, or is a minority part of the population. Something like maybe a half, even less than a half, there's probably some luminosity dependence to that. But, but most quasars are not point sources, they're not quasi-stellar. Um, here's a picture of the HST images of four wise selected quasars in the cosmos field. And, you know, some of them are beautiful point sources. Some of them maybe with Hubble, you're starting to see the host galaxy. But there's a large population where the, uh, this central engine, which is a supermassive black hole accreting at incredible rates, is completely obscured, completely hidden. And we call those the obscured quasars or the type 2 quasars. Um, it's a very rich field. Um, brief historical uh, overview, so how to find type 2 quasars. Uh, initial way, just like for the unobscured quasars going after radio selection, on the same days that people were chasing down unobscured quasars from radio selection, people were chasing down um, type 2 or obscured quasars from radio selection. And in fact, uh, my PhD was off with Hiram Spinrad at UC Berkeley, and you know, he spent a good fraction of his life chasing down high redshift radio galaxies. And here's from 1999, the highest redshift galaxies as a function of time, starting with Minkowski 3C295 in 1960 at redshift of a half, and high pushed above one and three um, with George and others. Um, so it used to be that the highest redshift galaxies were all these type two or obscured radio loud quasars. Um, sure. Yeah. So you're using type two to mean obscure. Yeah. So there's. I think in the quasar regime, there's different definitions of it, but uh, I think there's a fairly good overlap, but not complete overlap between narrow lined AGN, where you don't see the broad line region at these high luminosity regime, where the X ray properties show heavy obscuration, the mid IR properties show heavy, heavy obscuration. And so it's not a complete overlap in samples, but I think it's close enough that. I'm comfortable using that. Right. Um, second technique to find uh, type 2 quasars is x-ray selection. As Gunter and Fiona uh, spoke about yesterday, the shape of the x-ray background peaks at 20 to 30 keV. It implies that there's a large population of heavily obscured AGN in the universe. Uh, one of the goals of Chandra and XMM was to find that population, understand the x-ray background. I um, love this soapbox here, but uh, there's an influential paper from the early days of Chandra with classic type 2 quasar. Uh, they talk about it in, in the Chandra Deep Field South, one megasecond exposure we found at right of 3.7, the most distant type 2 active galactic nucleus ever detected. And since this was one of the goals of Chandra, uh, this was sort of a mission accomplished <laughs> uh, opportunity for that satellite. And just like when Bush used it, it's not quite true. That three years earlier, we had found radio galaxies out above Redshift 5. Um, but anyhow, uh, so all these techniques have some advantages, some disadvantages. The radio selection, just like for the unobscured quasars, we have the problem that you're just catching a minority fraction of the population. 
uh, for the X-ray selection, you really want to work, if you want to understand the population sources creating the 20 to 30 KEV background, you want to work at 20 to 30 KEV. And now with the new star, we're starting to do that. Uh, here's an image that we put out last week, a paper that came out early, at the end of August. Uh, but one of the things that we do that any time new star points at something, a neutron star, or a globular, uh, pardon, a galaxy cluster, whatever, or a local C42 galaxy, we see if there's any serendipitous new star sources in the field. We've picked up about 60 at this point. Uh, we had a paper on the first 10 that we had found. So here's a redshift, a couple tenth um, obscured quasar in the field of IC751. Um, you know, see that paper to see our early results. Anyhow, so the X-ray selection is working pretty well in new star. It's an exciting part of that. Uh, optical selection is another way of doing it. Uh, Nadia Zamanska had a nice set of papers on these type 2 quasars selected from the Sloan survey. Uh, Chuck had a nice paper on a LBG that was clearly a narrow-lined AGN at redshift 2 or 3 in the Hubble Deep Field North that didn't have an X-ray detection, uh, that generation of X-ray data. Um, the disadvantage of the optical selection is spectroscopy is pretty cumbersome. And so I think it's really the mid-IR selection which is changing the game. First with spits, or now really with Ys, which is to map the whole sky deeper than two mass, essentially, in the mid-infrared. And so that's the focus of most of my talk. But I'll just remind you that there's a, kind of two models of the obscuration we have in our head. We have the typical, you know, the Taurus models you all are very familiar with. Um, Meg was showing this just now, where it's essentially the same sources viewed at different angles will either be obscured or unobscured, and you know, maybe, um, it's a clumpy torus, maybe you have a receding torus. Like Gunter spoke about yesterday, that the more luminous AGN blow out their torus more and there's more sight lines in. But essentially it's just orientation. And then we have this other model, more like dynamical models like Phil spoke about yesterday, where it's more time domain, that there's a period of time where a given AGN will be obscured pretty much from any viewing angle until it blows out its region and then we can see the AGN. Um, Real quick, how does the mid-IR selection of AGN work? It's very simple. It's related to the early work on quasars. Um, essentially, you're s distinguishing the power law spectrum of a quasar from the more complicated spectral energy distribution of a galaxy. And here I have an SA galaxy in Virgo. But between the optical and the mid-IR, most of the flux is dominated by the sort of bell curve, um, which is largely the photospheres of the low mass stars that dominate the mass of the galaxy, peaks at 1.6 microns. In the early days, we went after UV excess sources, sources that were too blue to be stars or galaxies, very effective at finding the unobscured quasars. And now with Spitzer and Wise, we can go after the IR excess sources, which aren't falling with that Rayleigh genes drop off that the stellar photospheres have. The advantage of the IR excess is that you get both the obscured and the unobscured sources. The obscuration hides that UV light, uh, hides the soft X-ray light. And the other advantage is also for um, high redshift sources like the Mortlock et al. redshift 7.09 quasar has no em detectable emission below one micron. Uh, that source is a nice detection in, this, in the WISE data set. So you can push to higher redshift with the IR excess as well. So in the early days of WISE, there are a couple of papers showing that WISE color-color diagrams or pardon, Spitzer color-color diagrams are very effective at isolating quasars from stars and galaxies. Uh, here's a spectroscopic sample in the Boudis field, actually the Aegis survey that Juno was talking about yesterday. Um, the stars essentially all sit down at zero, zero color and vega magnitudes. Essentially everything from an O star to a T3 star is just a Rayleigh genes fall off in the Spitzer bands. And so they all sit at zero, zero in Vega. The galaxies out to redshift of a half basically make this horizontal swath. Um, and then when you get above redshift one, they start making this vertical cut. So if I did a, rather than a spectroscopic sample, if I just showed everything seen by Spitzer in this field, there's quite a bit of sources going up that um, left-hand side of that panel. And then the quasars are very well isolated from everything else. And so there's the stern wedge. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done on this. There's the lesser. Lacy wedge, uh, which is basically just a different set of, uh, of uh, axes for the color-color diagram. Uh, Jennifer Donnelly did some nice work on power law selection, or more recently, she has a really nice paper last year on uh, color selection, so it's more similar to uh, what Mark Lacy and I had done, but Mark Lacy and I worked 
our work was based on very shallow surveys, and Jennifer shows you what to do if you have very deep Spitzer data, like you have in Cosmos or the goods fields. Um, there's so much work on this, but a lot. Glickman has a, and her collaborators have a nice set of papers on uh, radio two mass selected, obscured quasars. Uh, Mar Nat had a nice paper last year on uh, ROSAP plus Y selected, but there's a very rich literature to this. Um, Nick Ross as well has contributed. Now I'm going to now emphasize some of the work that we've been doing with Ys. And sort of a series of three papers that we have on Y selected AGN. Uh, first paper uh, I led came out last year on Y selection of AGN in the cosmos field. So I use this two square degree field, which has so much supporting data to motivate the selection of Y's AGN. A uh, former postdoc of mine is just starting a faculty job in Santiago. Roberto Assef had a paper came out earlier this year going to the Buides field, where we, uh, Juna talked about where um, 10 square degrees with a lot of deep supporting data. And then just today on Astro PH, uh, our third paper came out with Y selection of AGN in the Sloan survey. And so basically, even prior to the launch of WISE, we realized that WISE was going to be this incredible black hole hunter. Uh, here's a, that same Spitzer color color diagram. But here, I'm just plotting everything that would be bright enough, everything that's well detected in WISE. So more than a 10 sigma detection in the first two band passes of WISE. And what we realized prior to the launch of WISE was that the uh, quasars in that wedge separate out very well from the galaxies of star and stars, even without that horizontal axis, which was good because Ys has very similar band passes to IRAC 1 and 2. They have uh, 3.6 and 4.5 and Spitzer. It's 3.4 and 4.6 for Ys. Ys doesn't have that horizontal axis of, um, to, to use. But luckily, the, the Ys 1 minus Ys 2 very cleanly separates out the quasars from the stars and galaxies. Um, we show that at W1 minus W2 of 0.8 picks up uh, 62 quasars per square degree on the sky. Uh, the, the reliability is above 90%. The completeness relative to the mid-IR selection is very high at 80%. Um, the uh, contamination, uh, contamination, you get brown dwarfs cooler than, 10 th than T3 stars will come in there. Those are very rare in the sky, especially at the depths that we're talking about. And then high redshift galaxies can come in there. But what we've done here is we've required a 10 sigma detection in W1 and W2, which effectively gets rid of those high redshift galaxies. Um, the, this W2 of 15 for our typical Elvis quasar template corresponds to I of like 19 to 20, similar to the Sloan quasar sample. So we think we're picking up similar luminosity quasars to Sloan, but we pick up three times as many per square degree because we're picking up the obscured and the unobscured. And this sort of ratio of two to one of obscured to unobscured, it's about what you expect to explain the x-ray background. Um, we have uh, some highlights from that first paper. Uh, we looked at the HST morphologies, about 50-50, resolved and unresolved. Uh, we show that, the op not surprisingly, the optical to mid-infrared color is very effective at separating out the obscured from the unobscured sources, or the type one and type two quasars. Uh, we find that 80% of them are detected by XMM in 60 kilosecond mapping of the cosmos field. 90% are detected by Chandra in their 100 kilosecond on mapping of the field. So this further shows that it's a very robust sample of AGN. I think that last 10% that Chandra doesn't see are just so obscured that the soft X-rays are hidden. It'll be exciting to see whether a new star starts picking up that, this last 10%. And then, you know, kudos to Peter Eisenhart, the project scientist for WISE. It's just incredible because this represents, you know, to map out cosmos by WISE represents a matter of minutes on this Explorer class mission, whereas the 100 kilosecond Chandra and 60 kilosecond XMM mapping of the field took multiple pointings, represents weeks of data from a flagship class mission. So mid IRs is incredibly powerful. Um, average redshifts are one, and I'll skip over the E Rosita predictions. But those are some of the highlights from that first Cosmos paper. Second paper, um, going to the Buides field, Roberto does SED fitting of all the Ys sources detected in W1 and W2, or out to five microns in Ys. He does uh, empirical templates that he had developed as part of his PhD with Chris Kochanik, uh, L old stellar population red, young stellar population in cyan, and then an AGN in the dark blue. And the AGN, we allowed variable 
obscuration to that AGN, find the best fit to, to each of the sources in the Boumediene field. Um, the redshifts are generally spectroscopic redshifts uh, or photometric redshifts for some. Uh, EB minus B shows you how much extinction we had to put on that AGN to fit the, the SED. And then A hat is this term that is what fraction of the light between 0.3 and 30 microns is coming from the AGN. So on the left hand side, we have something that's 80% AGN light, the AGN is unobscured. On the right, we have something that's 70% AGN, and the AGN is relatively obscured. And so he does that on the whole field. Um, there's a couple of nice things in it. Uh, something people might not appreciate is that WISE is on a polar orbit. What the net result is that the ecliptic polar, essentially, the ecliptic plane, or essentially the equator, WISE is shallower than towards the ecliptic poles. Um, so Cosmos was designed to be at the equator. That's about as shallow as WISE goes. It's about 90 seconds integration. Up at the poles, it's you know hours, hundreds of hours of depth gets to the confusion limit. And so uh, my Cosmos paper was wise and as shallow as it goes. Uh, Buidi's field is about 30, declination, 30 degree declination, and Roberto presents uh, color dependent Y selection of AGN, pardon, magnitude dependent color selection of Y's AGN if you have deeper data. Um, some of the highlights from that paper are um, we look at how likely is an AGN to be obscured as a function of its luminosity. We find that the more luminous AGN on the right are, less, are more likely to appear unobscured or as type 1, have a low amount of extinction on the AGN component, similar to what Gunter was showing in the x-rays, fits in with this receding torus idea that we have, that the more luminous AGN blow out their torus, have more sight lines down at the AGN. Uh, exciting to see this at a different wavelength regime, not a, not a super surprising result. Um, maybe on the more interesting side, uh, Here's a distribution of AGN obscuration uh, for all the uh, AGN in our sample in the Boudis field at the top and then split by different X-ray luminosity, or pardon, AGN luminosities. Uh, the solid line corresponds to that sort of 10 to the 22 uh, NH given a typical gas to dust ratio that on um, this typical to separate is obscured from unobscured quasars. Um, so this, that, the previous plot was using that line to separate the obscured from the unobscured. But there's hints from this data that there's a, no, a, a little dimple in the distribution at multiple AGN luminosity ranges at EB minus V of around 1 to 2. Um, I don't suggest it, but maybe you have a multiphasic obscuring medium. Uh, maybe if you're Moshe Elitzer, you jump up and down, and you're, this is evidence of a clumpy torus model. Maybe if you're Phil, you know, maybe the, some of the obscuration is coming from global scale dust from the merger, and some's coming more from a torus. I don't know, but we're pushing on this with much larger samples now from matching Ys with Sloan. And then um, a paper that just showed up on Astro PH today, uh, led by a uh, former postdoc who was here, Emilio Donoso, Lynn, myself, and Roberto, looking at the clustering of Y-selected AGN over thousands of square degrees of the Sloan survey field. So this is now doing a clustering analysis of nearly 200,000 Y-selected AGN over nearly 3,500 square degrees. Um, we uh, show, and we had shown this in previous papers, that the optical to Y's color does a pretty good job of separating out obscured from unobscured sources. You see multiple populations here. Um, maybe the bluer sources are a little bit tighter distribution. And the redder sources are a little bit wider distribution, so we definitely do get some red AGN, or what we think are obscured AGN, contaminating into the blue sample. Not as much happening in the other direction. Um, again, using the Cosmos HST imaging, we show images of a couple of them. Here's a Ys, W2 images of three of the AGN in the field. Here's the Sloan images. Some of them are undetected by Sloan. In fact, almost all of these are brighter than 24th magnitude. Um, in fact, I think all of them are. Um, in the cosmos field. And then here's the HST imaging. And we show that uh, the red, if we go to a red R minus W2 greater than 6, essentially all of them are resolved HST, so suggestive of obscured AGN. Um, essentially all of the point sources are blue um, in that R minus W2 color. And then we get a little bit of contamination of resolved sources in the blue sample. 
uh, here's a redshift distribution done in a couple different ways, but they're redshifts around one-ish. Um, and then here's the exciting result. This is the angular correlation function for red and blue Y-selected AGN using samples of 200, nearly 200,000 AGN for thousands of square degrees. And we find that the red AGN has a much higher bias than the blue AGN. Um, Ryan Hickox had had hints of this a couple years ago in the Buoides field. Uh, pretty low significance with something like 800 sources. Now we have nearly 200,000 sources. It's a very robust result. Doesn't make sense if the obscuration is just um, orientation, if it's just a torus, then these are the same things just seen at view different viewing angles. Instead, we're finding that the obscured AGN are sitting in dark matter halos are nearly order of magnitude more massive than the unobscured quasars. I can make up some reasons of why that might be the case. Um, maybe a theorist would be is, is more used to sticking out their necks and making up stories. Um, but it's if you want to quiz me later, I can tell you one possible explanation. And yeah, super exciting result. We're really proud of that paper. I'll take a look at it on today's Astro PH. And then finally, the, the last piece of research that the WISE team has been working on really hard recently is if you're able to find samples of million, you know, three million, six million AGN across the sky using WISE and, and do all sorts of studies with that, you also find the most extreme AGN in the sky. And so We've been playing with a couple of different selections, but one of the selections that has proven very exciting is to look for objects that don't show up in Y swan in the upper right. So don't show up at 3.4 microns, they don't show up at 4.6 microns, and they pop up at 12 and 22 microns. We call them W1, W2 drop sources. So about one per 30 square degree on the sky. We have a sample of about 1,000 in the extragalactic sky. We've been chasing them down for the last two, three years now. Um, the, the redshifts are almost all showing up to be between 1.5 and 2.5. Uh, highest redshift guy we found is a redshift 4.6. Here's one of the first ones that we got. Um, and it, it actually ends up, there's not too many that look like this. Um, most of them end up showing narrow emission lines, look like type 2 quasars, and they're carbon 4 helium 2. But we have a couple that really, you don't see any evidence of the AGN in the optical spectrum. This is Alice's LBG composite. It really looks like the same thing. In fact, it's an L star. It essentially looks like an L star Lyman break galaxy. Chuck has thousands of these. Um, and yet, this thing is jumping up to like six and a half magnitude at 20 microns, which most of Chuck's sources are not doing anything close to that. Um, AGN features are seen in at least half of them. We're still work, we're work, uh, working on a paper that will get into the statistics. Uh, we have HST and adaptive optics imaging of about a dozen. They don't seem to be lensed. Uh, we do the spectral energy distribution analysis of them. And um, essentially, our best fit is that you have this extremely luminous AGN, extremely extincted for the 1814 guy. We have to stick 50 magnitudes of extinction on top of this luminous AGN. So basically, below observed 10 microns, um, it's dominated by the AGN. Below that, it's dominated by just a normal galaxy. Uh, if for a typical gas-to-dust ratio, these are Compton thick, AGN extremely luminous, volumetric luminosities approaching 10 to the 14th solar luminosities. Um, I've been following them up with CSO, with Herschel, um, getting some millimeter data for them. Initially, we thought that they were going to jump up at 850 microns. They're not. They tend to be hotter than the Euler sample, um, peaking at temperatures of, you know, peaking at like 10 to 50 keV um, microns, sorry. And so we, we've also called them hot dogs for hot, dust-obscured galaxies. Um, and then finally, a uh, paper that we're working on right now is trying to get at the demographics of them. Uh, Roberto is doing the SED modeling of them, similar to the plot I showed before. Uh, the SED modeling reveals the presence of a heavily obscured, extremely luminous AGN. Uh, here's the, you know, this is work in progress, but here's the current volumetric luminosity of the AGN distribution. They're extremely luminous, 10 to the 47, 10 to the 48 orders per second. And the, what's very surprising, though, is that the surface density of them on the sky, or the volume density even, seems to be comparable to even maybe higher than unobscured quasars at these sort of luminosities and these sorts of redshifts. So these are 
heavily obscured, extremely luminous quasars. Um, very exciting work. Um, so I don't really have a summary, I have an anti-summary, because at this point, it's sort of what do we unlearn? And maybe in five years or two years, I can give you the summary of what we've learned, but what have we unlearned? Well, we've learned that the bulk of the quasar population is neither quasi-stellar nor radio loud. Uh, we learned that the clustering analysis shows that the obscured quasars are much more massive dark matter halos than the unobscured quasars. I don't know how that fits in with a um, traditional Taurus model of AGN. And then we're finding this large population of extremely luminous, extremely obscured AGN that doesn't fit in with the receding Taurus models. All sorts of observations over the last decade showing that more luminous AGN are less obscured. So, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah. A question that I thought I asked. Yes. Question, Traditional. Yes. Question How do you know the red AGN has a higher red shift than the blue AGN? So, from Cosmos, we have pretty thorough spectroscopic coverage, more than 90%, not 100%, and, but then we have photo Zs even. And so, I, I skipped through that slide, but we have the redshift distribution from Cosmos. And then actually from Buides, we have the ages survey. And that redshift distribution, which has all sorts of crazy, even though it's not optically selected, even though it has some crazy um, selection effects, the redshift distribution seems pretty comparable. So I, I think we have a good handle on the redshift distribution. Yeah, and they're not quite the same, and that's part of the analysis. And in fact, the direction of their differences points to a bigger difference in their host galaxy halos, I, I believe. So the comment is, with that in mind, I actually have a slightly different interpretation model on the Hickox idea that there's actually trouble for the, the um, evolution, that you have the obscure phase burn in the somehow high yeah. mass halos. And so I actually think it's trouble. Yeah. Are you scared, Phil? In particular, the mergers are probably what's happening with that, that and last and hot dog population.
Yeah, well, um, I think it's early days for New Star. I think some of the really exciting stuff, I just got a draft of a paper this morning from the, what? We did Mark Herring 231. Fiona spoke about that yesterday. Um, it's a really unexpected result. We're doing some more ULERGs now. And you don't yet have the results? Not fully analyzed, but we can talk about it offline. <laughs>